Around the world, the race to develop a vaccine against the new coronavirus continues apace. The World Health Organization is now tracking more than 170 candidate vaccines. In the pre-clinical stage, researchers test if the vaccine triggers an immune response in animals. In phase one testing, the vaccine is given to a small group of people to see if it's safe. Phase two involves a somewhat larger research group to test dosages. And in phase three, the vaccine is given to thousands of people to make sure it's effective. So far, there are no successful candidates. Vaccines normally require years of testing and time to build up production volume. The WHO has said it doesn't expect widespread vaccinations against coronavirus until mid-2021. But even that is optimistic. Germany's top biotech companies and clinics are rushing to come up with a vaccine to defeat the novel coronavirus. Some are already carrying out human testing after the lengthy approval process was speeded up. The stakes are that high. And so, let's take a look at how the trials work. A little pinprick, but it brings high hopes with it. Inside the syringe, a vaccine from the CureVac company. It's designed to imitate the coronavirus in the body to provoke an immune response. About 200 people have volunteered to take part in the trial. This way I can do my bit to help defeat the virus. Ten companies in Germany are currently working to defeat the virus by developing vaccines. Two are already testing their vaccines on humans, in trials that generally consist of a number of phases. After discovery in the lab, there are preclinical tests. Then comes phase one, which is mainly focused on whether the human body can tolerate the vaccine and the reaction of the immune system. Phase two looks at how high the dosage has to be, and phase three tests effectiveness, whether the vaccine offers protection in everyday life. Normally, approval takes about eight to 10 years, but now the process is supposed to go much faster. Here at the University of Tübingen Hospital, scientists are working on phase one. From the data so far, we can see that the vaccine is well tolerated and safe, and we also hope that the first signals of the immune defense, which are becoming apparent, are also very positive. Another company from Germany is already testing its vaccine on humans. BioNTech, based in the German city of Mainz, is partnering with the US pharmaceutical company Pfizer. They are already combining phases two and three, testing whether the vaccine actually protects against coronaviruses in everyday life. BioNTech has around 30,000 volunteer test subjects worldwide. It hopes to have an approved vaccine before the end of the year. The head of Germany's medical regulatory body thinks Germany is on the right track. German vaccine developers are well advanced. They're in a global premier league. These are modern platform technologies for vaccines. I expect that even two vaccines could possibly come from Germany. If there are more, so much the better. A vaccine for everyone by early next year. An ambitious goal that will require a lot more pinpricks. Well, let's speak to Professor Ulrich de Nagel. He's a neurologist and founding director of the Quest Centre for Transforming Biomedical Research. Thanks for joining us. The search for a vaccine is all about trading off speed and safety. How have regulators managed to quicken the approval process without compromising on safety? I guess that's the $100 million question and uh, so far unanswered. Uh, I think, uh, in principle, speed uh, and certainty are um, at odds fundamentally. And so one has to make a trade-off here. This is about risk-benefit. And um, I think um, it's, at the moment, it's very much at the discretion of those agencies, whether they are uh, accelerating, whether they are fast-track approving drugs, uh, in particular vaccines now, or not. And a lot of this obviously is uh, not really transparent, so we don't know much about those processes. Yeah, I think what a lot of people might be wondering is whether or not we can be certain that any vaccine that does go through this streamlined process uh, is totally safe. 
Uh, certainly, I mean, there's nothing that is totally safe in, safe, in particular not with vaccine or drug development. And there are uh, certain risks, uh, certainly with vaccines, and they may even be, laid, be delayed, those risks. Um, so that is obviously a very um, uh, difficult decision. Um, and uh, at least I, and I think I'm in the uh, community uh, with many others, uh, would argue that we should not sacrifice safety um, for speed here um, because too much is at, at stake. But uh, in principle, there, there, although there are these rules, uh, and you mentioned the phase one, two, three, and so forth, um, at, in the end, it's at the hands uh, and in the decision of the regulators uh, to fast track. And so um, we can only hope that there is good evidence um, and that the evidence will be weighed. Um, so far, um, it's hard to tell whether we're on the right track. We all know that there have been drug trial, that there are trials that have been halted, one trial in particular, and there are concerns about the phase one, two trial from, from Russia. Um, so this just shows that this is very sensitive and, and uh, the public has to really follow this. Um, in fact, r right now, over the weekend, I think we had the release of uh, trial protocols from the three major drug companies that are running those uh, uh, phase three trials, um, which is unheard of and I think is a good development because it allows uh, experts and also the public to scrutinize uh, what they are doing. Yeah, speaking of scrutiny, we should talk about Russia, which you did just mention. Back in early August, they said that they'd approved a working vaccine, Sputnik V, as they're calling it. Uh, but the international community, the WHO, has basically rejected that. Are we any closer to knowing whether that is an effective vaccine? No, not at all. I mean, there was a publication in The Lancet uh, only recently, I think um, less than two weeks ago, um, but uh, it, it, it reports on a phase one slash two trial that is open and that actually has no uh, true efficacy uh, endpoint. It just looks at immune responses. It does not look at whether it prevents actually those uh, infections. Uh, and it's a very small study and it has raised uh, concerns. In fact, there is a, an open letter of concern um, about uh, the uh, validity of the data. And in fact, Lancet has contacted the authors uh, to respond to it. They have not responded. Uh, they have said that they are going to respond, but they haven't done so yet. So um, we don't know. It's very unlikely that in such a short time period, uh, any nation could uh, determine safety and efficacy of such an approach. Now, that continues to be controversial, that one. Uh, do you think what will come out of this pandemic is pot potentially a, a different model for approving medication? Do you think we will have a swifter process going forward? Well, um, we will see whether uh, the bet uh, uh, will materialise and wh whether these fast developments actually pay off. That will certainly push it in this direction. But the, the whole um, issue of accelerated approval is actually not a new development. In fact, there have been discussions uh, of this topic uh, for many years now, especially from patient communities, for example, uh, child, uh, pa parents of children with severe diseases who argue that they don't have the time to wait for, la for large clinical trials and that they want almost experimental treatments right now. And we, we, we should be aware of the fact that 16% of the FDA approvals right now already are on an accelerated mode. So this is not a new uh, development, it's an ongoing discussion. And many experts, ethicists, uh, but also biomedical researchers mm -hmm. are concerned about this um, because uh, we are lowering the bar uh, and this certain, must certainly increase uh, the associated risks so Professor um, at least I said I'm, I'm Thank you for bringing us up to date. Well. I'm afraid we've run out of time. We could talk about this all day, of course. Yeah. Professor Ulrich de Nagel, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. And now it's time for your questions to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Why has the COVID-19 mortality rate dropped so much? I answered this a few months ago, but what was a, a fairly tenuous trend back then has turned into an, to an undeniable one today, so I'm going to answer it again. Um, first of all, I need to emphasize that, that mortality rate, which is our best guess of the percentage of people who will on average die from the disease if they contract it, um, that's only something we'll really be able to calculate with any accuracy after the pandemic is over. Um, what we can look at now 
during the pandemic is what's called the case fatality rate, which is the proportion of people who have died from among the people who we know beyond doubt have had it, uh, the ones who have tested positive for the disease. And as you rightly say, that number has fallen pretty dramatically over the last few months um, by around half in some countries. The experts say there are a couple of reasons why. Um, first and foremost, there's the experience factor. Um, the more medical professionals all over the world treat severely ill patients, uh, the better they get at, at knowing how to save them. Uh, then, of course, there's the fact that the number of tests being carried out on a daily basis is, is rising continuously, which means we're catching a, a lot more positives than earlier in the pandemic, uh, when testing was, was limited mostly to, to people who were severely ill in hospital settings. Um, now we're also confirming a lot more cases among those who have mild or, or no symptoms. And that's related to, to the third factor, um, the experts say, which is that the rise in testing means that we're now also detecting COVID-19 much more frequently in young people. And as we all know by now, uh, they're much less likely to die from the disease um, than older people are. Uh, finally, some experts have expressed hope that the case fatality rate is maybe falling because maybe the virus is now mutating to be, to be less virulent, um, but that's still pretty highly speculative.